Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another episode of Back to My Garden. And we have a very unique guest today, folks. Todd believes that a garden should make you feel like you've entered into privileged space, a place not just set apart, but, re- but reverberant. He's a landscape and garden designer, as well as a former instructor of landscape design at Columbia University, and he has a brilliant garden blog at www.toddhaymanlandscapedesign.com. We have a ton to discuss. Please welcome, from I believe it's Lower Manhattan in New York City, Mr. Todd Heyman. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, I'm flattered. It's an honor. I listen to I listen to your uh, blog, your posts quite often. So thank you again. I'm excited that you're here, Todd, and I want to get to know you better. And our listeners want to hear your stories. So sit back and relax, and take a couple of minutes. Share with us a little bit about your background and how did you get into gardening? Okay. Well, I grew up in in Brooklyn, New York. I didn't spend any time gardening when I was a child, although my mother probably had 500 houseplants. My mother can make anything grow. Um, but as, as an adult, I was a photographer. That was my first career. And I loved, I loved that career. And at a certain point, I decided it was time to uh, take on new challenges. And it began from creating a roof garden on a building which I co-own with some other people. Uh, It started with basically not having any irrigation whatsoever, putting a planter up on top of the building and growing tomatoes and basil and walking walking upstairs with five gallons of water every day. And eventually it came to building this roof garden out even more uh, um, in detail, putting up plants, realizing I don't know that much of what I'm doing, so starting to take classes. And one thing led to another, and I studied at the New York Botanical Gardens for two years. At that point, I said to myself, okay, this is the start of a new chapter in my life. I want to take even more, learn even more. Uh, Where can I get more knowledge? And I decided to apply to Columbia University that has a landscape design master's. Uh, They were... They were, they were very nice, and they, they accepted me into the program, and that was just an incredible journey. Uh, I met with some amazing professors, some mentors, who to this day I'm still incredibly close with. And I also believe that when you embrace education at a little bit later age, not when you're you know, 18, 22, when you're going to college – you're just a lot more serious about it. Um, and you appreciate it even more the second time around, at least for me. And from and at that point right now, I, I, um, they, I was very successful in terms of my academic career. I, I was fortunate. I won multiple awards. The, Columbia had asked me to stay on and, and help teach, and I did that. And at the same time, that was, I think, the be- that was during the recession uh, here. And nobody was hiring. While well, I did meet with multiple um, multiple firms, nobody was hiring. So I said, well, you know what? I had my own firm before. Uh, let me try it again. I did that, and it, it just took off. And um, so far, it's been a great ride. I've been fortunate in some terrific clients and some great projects. So what I do essentially is I do gardens in... Manhattan. I do gardens in Brooklyn. Essentially, a lot of gardens in in New York City where it's close confines and it's urban gardening. And then I also have uh, some roof gardens as well as um, backyards. I also do vacation homes. I work on a, a college upstate New York. And I have some suburban properties also everywhere from the White Mountains of New Hampshire to closer to New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut. So I'm within the tri-state area to some degree. Nice. An excellent starting point. Uh, Listeners, if you're driving, don't take notes. I'm going to have all of Todd's links and resources mentioned on the blog at backtomygarden.com. I invite you to follow Todd and connect with him on Twitter at 
TH Garden Design. And then you must bookmark and share uh, www.toddhaymanlandscapedesign.com. Hayman is H A I M A N. Uh, Todd, maybe we can start in your transition from photography to garden design. Because as you were describing your start, I, I got some insight. I always look at uh, garden designers as having that special skill like a, a painter or a musician. Like the the idea of writing a song is just mysterious to me, right? As is garden design. Do you think your early days in photography helped you as a garden designer? Well, without a doubt. Essentially, what I did is I looked through a camera and I had to make these perfect images for advertising agencies for Fortune five hundred clients. But that was two dimensional. Um, when you think about garden design, landscape design, you're talking about four dimensions. Now, I say four dimensions. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously, it's three-dimensional, but there's also the fourth dimension in this art. And the fourth dimension is time. When you design a landscape, it is not static. It doesn't, um, it isn't what it is today. You have to think about what it's going to be five years, ten years. Um, And that was taught to me by one of the professors I had um, who has had such an effect upon my career and the way I think about it, his name is Daryl Morrison. He's one of the people who actually, um, I would say he's responsible for the native plant move- movement in this country to a large degree. He used to be the dean at the University of Georgia. Um, he, and he ended up teaching me about plants and, um, and plant communities and the relationship between plants and, and, and nature. Um, at Columbia. But yes, looking through a camera, which is two dimensional, to creating a, a landscape. And let's face it, you're creating pictures in a landscape, you're creating focal points. Um, so without a doubt, it transitioned from one space to another. The other thing was that as a photographer, I would have assistants that worked for me, I would have producers that would help produce a shoot. We would have models and talent. We would have location scouts, makeup people. So it was a collaborative um, process, much like designing a garden is. I will create it for a client. I'll work with a client because even though um, what I'm doing is I'm creating a space, an outdoor space, which is an extension of the indoor space, an outdoor room, so to speak, uh, all rooms, And to do this, I can't do this myself. I have people that do installations. I have masons. I have contractors, you know, landscapers. I have engineers I work with, surveyors I work with. Um, So there's multiple people you work with. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, And truthfully, even though I design it, it's all these people that I work with that actually make me look good. Um, so it's in, in one case, it's very much like making a film, I think. Hmm. Man, great well, analogy, because you're, you're really wearing so many hats, because that's the soul of it. You're an entrepreneur, you're a job creator, you're building an economy, but you have to keep that artistic hat on. Yes, and there is this balance between um, art and commerce, which is always a challenge to have. When you're creative and you're trying to have a business, you always have to balance the two of them. Uh, If you would be so kind as to go into your bag of tricks, we have a lot of listeners in urban settings all over the world, patios specifically, a lot of uh, condo dwellers. What are some of your favorite ways of starting with that difficult small space? It must be incredibly challenging. Well, it is, but it's really no more challenging than any other space because no matter what you're designing, you always have constraints or parameters you want to work within. And what I say to clients is that um, I'm working with their needs, their aspirations, and their challenges. So how do you address all those things? Well, part of it is realizing that this outdoor room, in this case, it's an urban space, it's an extension of your indoor space. So what what do you need outdoors? 
Do you want a barbecue? Do you want a place to eat? Do you have young children that you need a space for them to run around? Or is it maybe just a place, a show garden, or just this beautiful garden? Do you want to grow vegetables? So let's talk about what you need. Do you want privacy? So certainly in a small urban space, many people want privacy. Um, And then you're limited by what the codes are. So for instance, in New York City, you typically are only allowed to have a six-foot wall around your space. So how do you get past that if you want a little bit higher? Well, you can grow put it, they're saying a six foot um, wall, but that wall is a built situation. You can have a temporary situation by attaching maybe a lattice to it and letting vines grow up, okay? So that becomes temporary. So you can go a little bit higher than that. Um, and let's not forget, if you plant trees, Well, trees grow up high. Many trees grow higher than six feet. Most trees will grow higher than six feet. So think about that. Um, And, of course, think about, obviously, also, if you're going to put something in, wherever it might be, whether it's an urban situation or a um, suburban situation, you always have to think about what is the maturation size of the plant you're putting in. So, again, like I said to you, Landscape is four dimensions. You have to think about what's this going to be in five years, ten years. As a designer, uh, if you had your pick, what's more rewarding? Is getting that blank canvas of a new build or inheriting a a well-developed older uh, space to redevelop or redesign? Um, Let me say that what makes me happiest is watching my clients walk into a garden when it's done nice. or when it's when it's installed and seeing them enjoy it because that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm trying to make somebody happy. I'm trying to enrich somebody's life. You know, you could say that, um, what do you do for a living? I'm a garden designer. I'm a landscape designer. But really, my goal is to make is to enrich other people's lives, and that's that's pretty cool to be able to do that in um, to somebody and. Nowadays, most people live very stressed lives, and you create an oasis for them. Um, I know I'm not answering your question, but that's sort of the way I approach things. Um, I really like that. The f- emphasis is on the client. I imagine you've had a few clients come to you almost at their wits' end or despondent. Um, yes, I actually did. One of my first clients, he, um, great guy, really loved this guy, and he had a of a suburban property. He was born and bred a New Yorker, um, and he has a suburban property. It was um, approximately six acres. And let me put it this way. The slope on this was, it went from, it was a hundred foot differential between the top to the bottom. Okay. So it was a complete slope and it just leveled out at one point. And truthfully, I had never worked on anything like that. So I was just working from uh, academic knowledge. I hadn't physically built something on a situation like that. But I studied it and I worked with a friend of mine who I went to school with. Um, her name is Denora Matias. And what we basically did was we, we, were, we met with this guy and he says, listen, I tried to figure this out myself. I've been trying to figure it out for multiple years. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and he admitted to it, Um, even though the guy had great taste, um, he didn't understand how to um, how to manage the erosion, how to manage the slope. So we came up with ways of doing that and it worked out terrific. And he's a very, very happy guy. Every time I go to visit his property, he's like, you see this? This is all you. I said, no, it isn't. I said, it's it's us together. We collaborated together. so, yeah, so, but in the end, it's again, it's, it's making the client happy. I love that word. It's a collaboration. I, I imagine those first meetings, you're just asking a lot of questions. Yes. And it's a, I kind of look at it as a process. Um, typically, what I do is a client, some, a prospective client calls me, and then I go to meet with them and I ask them what their needs are, what their long term plans are. Um, and we talk, and um, 
obviously I give them a proposal afterwards. And, and if they like the proposal, then we move forward and I get to know them. And again, it's a process. And first I, I'll work with them, showing them preliminary ideas. Then we move to final plans and it changes as it goes through. It really does. Um, what I like to do is I like to show them what it's going to look like three dimensionally. So I, I design things um, with um, uh, m many times I'll design it in a, in a software called SketchUp. Uh, which um, um, is actually free. It's um, you can you can download it for free from Google. Um, I use a professional version of it, but that's a nice way of designing something three dimensionally, so people can actually see what it looks like. And somebody who has their own garden, who's not going to hire a designer, garden designer, can actually learn how to do this software. It's very very easy. It's very intuitive, and figure out the space relationships with themselves, which is so so. Um, it's so helpful. Nice. I've been listening to your language. I, I have the unique perspective. I get to interview garden designers, and the language you use is either visual or kinesthetic. You describe either texture and color and dimensions of a space, or on the other, the garden designers talk about the feel of a space or the energy of a space. I hear you using lots of visual terminology. You know, obviously with photography in your background, that makes sense. Uh, what do you do with clients that uh, come to you and yet want to be in charge or resist you? Do you have to kind of make them? It's almost like the client is as much of a project as the garden. Um, I don't I don't fight with my clients because I'm designing a space for them. Some clients will say, Go ahead. It's a clean slate. Do what you want. And other clients uh, come up with terrific ideas for them. But in the end, it ends up being closer to, what can I say, what they had in the past or what they envision um, or something they might have seen before. Um, and remember, this is, like I said before, this, it's not art. It's commerce. And there's a relationship between the two. So I will give a client idea and, either, and maybe they'll go forward on it or we'll, we'll work back and forth and it'll be a mixture of, of what they want and what I want. I like to say that um, the, the garden, the space I'm designing is for the client, but I design it like it's for myself and in the end there's a little bit of my soul in there when I walk away. The reason I ask such a direct question is a lot of listeners have teenagers or college-age kids. And I'm trying to raise the conversation of horticulture as a viable career path as opposed to, say, sitting in an office under a fluorescent bulb in a cubicle for somebody who loves the outdoors. What would you say to somebody, you know, nervous about pursuing a career in horticulture? Um, it is a bit of an to be honest about it, it's a bit of an uphill battle in that I, I go to London, I go to England every year to look at gardens and the relationship between people and horticulture there, it's just in their blood. And there's an enormous respect for gardeners and people in horticulture there. Whereas it's not as much, it's not really as much here. It's not a part of who we are. And maybe that's a part of the fact that for centuries, when um, the Brits um, were, were um, I wouldn't say conquering, but they were establishing themselves throughout the world, whether it was the American colonies, whether it was in India, whether it was in Australia, wherever they went, they built gardens to sort of feel at home. Um, so it's, it's part of their culture. It isn't so much here. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is that um, the word yard – when we say our yard, really, when you, if you look up the definition of a yard, in many cases, it's going to be like a place where you put a car up on blocks. OK, it's a place where you store things. So I try and train my clients and say your garden. It might be a yard now, but it's going to be a garden. It's going to be an oasis. But getting back to, you, to your question about horticulture, there's something very special about being around nature. And, um, you know, I think... People joke about the fact is somebody said to me, I think it was, that you 
if you, I hope I say this correctly, but who needs a therapist when you have a garden? In other words, it's just so soothing to one and it's a great way to clear one's head and it's a great way to, and it's a way to just to feel at ease with oneself. Oh, absolutely. There's a subreddit. Reddit is like a big uh, social media site, but the whole subreddit is just people sharing their uh, testimonials being prescribed by their doctor to take up gardening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. So, but, um, I would think that having knowledge of horticulture as we move forward with climate change, um, with the truth of the matter is that right now we're in a um, we're in an upswing in terms of our economy. So you have more and more people who are willing to spend money on their outdoor space. So I would think it's a you know from that point of view, I say it's a good field to go into. Yeah, you garden in one of the most densely packed, uh, wealthiest per square foot of land in the world. Yes, that's true, and um, I try and relate to a lot of the properties I work on. Like, for instance, these, the brownstones that I work on in Brooklyn. You're talking about a 100-foot deep by about 20-foot wide plot. That You have these beautiful brownstones that were built, or townhouses that were built, um, like 1890s, 1905, that sort of range. And there's usually a 40 to 50-foot space land behind the building which is what is turned into a garden so and it with the value of manhattan real estate or new york city real estate being what it is you know these are prime prime areas so you put a wall around it and everyone's uh, um, cloistered together and i like to think of these these small spaces very much like a medieval walled garden where You know, in the Middle Ages, the wealthy would sort of bring nature within the walls and put these put these walls up to keep what can I say the riffraff or the commoners out. Um, And that's really what's going on a lot in the city is that you end up having these spaces where um, you have to bring nature in and you have to create a sort of like a false sense of, of, of nature. I love it. You know, our time is flying by, Todd. Uh, I just glanced at the clock, and that right. was the time. And I did want to tell you one thing. Please. That your, um, your podcast has actually connected me with somebody. It's a very funny story. When you first said to me, Let's, um, uh, would you be interested in speaking, I, I looked at your podcast, and I started to listen to it some more, and I listened to uh, the one that you had with Catherine Alto, which was a wonderful, wonderful podcast. Now, she and I were following one another on Twitter, and we really didn't know who each other were, other than we appreciated each other's uh, thoughts and comments. And then as I'm listening to her, I realized I had met her last year at the Chelsea Flower Show in London. And I only realized that from listening to a podcast. So then we started to connect a little bit more about with one another. So you bring, so in a, in a way, you sort of like brought us together. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Small, well, it's, it is. It's a rather intimate community of very well, uh, wonderful people. Gardeners are incredible people, and they're very giving. They're very passionate. Um, yeah. It, so yeah, I like it. Uh, it's the time in the show where I uh, drill you with five quick questions. It's like a rapid fire round where you share your wisdom and experience with novice rookie gardeners. And I try and do it uh, succinctly. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but I've changed the questions for 2015, so you have to stay, ah. n- stay nimble. Okay. Question number one. Uh, what's the funniest or strangest or most outrageous mistake that you've made in a garden that you're willing to admit to in public? Uh, what's mistake have I done? Um, wrong plant, wrong place. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has found that. You know, the, the wonderful thing about gardening and horticulture is that it's constant learning. You can never stop learning. I love it. I guess in New York City, you get all four seasons, so you have to be particularly cautious because of the investment in certain plants. That's correct. Um, 
we get all four seasons, which brings up another thing is the question is, can you build a four season garden for somebody or for yourself? Because you have to have structure because in the winter time in those gray days of winter, when you're looking out, you need to have something to see. So many people actually design a garden beginning with winter. So what's it going to look like in winter? Because we know it's easy to design a garden so that you have lots of flowers in spring and summer. So what? try to make a garden that looks great in winter time. Wow, that's wisdom. I like that. You could Google all day and not figure that one out. All right. Um, question two. This gives us some insight into you personally is, uh, Todd, if you were only allowed to grow one plant next year, what plant would you have to grow? If I was only allowed to grow one plant, well, that depends upon really what I see at the Chelsea Flower Show each year and I become passion crazy about. <laughs> you know, I, listen, I, as, as gardeners, we fall in love with plants and we have to have something each year. And this is, you can never have enough plants. You just run out of space or time to take care of them. Um, so you're going with no no answer. That's that's I'm smart. Try, I'm trying to think. You know, it's um, I love roses, but they're so high maintenance. But meanwhile, I have ten different roses on my roof. Wow. Um, I guess tomatoes. I grow tomatoes on my roof, nice. uh, so it's it, I have to have t- fresh tomatoes. Living in New York City. Do you love London, England? I think it's one of the most incredible cities. Yes, it is. You know, for for for, for a New Yorker, it's easy. It's there's so many similarities there. Yeah. And for a gardener, I'm telling you, you can walk. You can have a conversation with anybody who stop on the street about horticulture. It's truly amazing. We I'm exaggerating, but yes. I try to explain to my friends, like after say soccer and rugby or football and rugby, gardening would be their third sport. Right, right, yeah. And, just... and and the Chelsea Flower Show is actually one of the three cultural high points of the year. There's there's the boat races, there's Wimbledon, and there's Chelsea. Chelsea's been going on for over 100 years. Amazing. <laughs> I'm, uh, Thompson and Morgan, their seed company, is older than the country of Canada. I can, really? <laughs> you know, we're running around in birch bark canoes trading beaver pelts. And they're having flower shows. It's just incredible. Uh, So there's a tip of the hat to my friends in England that listen to the show. Uh, Question three is about the Internet. Do you have any favorite gardening websites that you might use as a resource? Um, Yes. I actually wrote this down because I figured you would ask me this. Um, Two of them. One of of them is the New York Botanical – I'm sorry, the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, okay, bbg.org. They have an amazing website for the home gardener. So much about composting, uh, so much about growing in different conditions. So it's bbg.org. I highly recommend it. And in fact, they also have books that they publish, small little books. They're very inexpensive, and they do a terrific job. Um, books for on tubers, books on tomatoes, books on roses, books on um, native, uh, uh, native alternatives to invasive plants. Things like that. Outstanding. So that that would be one. Um, what would another one be? I'm trying to think of. Um, well, the RHS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, RHS.org. Um, they're, you know, they're just about educating um, the public. So that's another great website. Nice. RHS.org. It feeds perfectly into question four. Do you have, I know you've got lots, uh, a favorite gardening book that you can recommend? Well, you had mentioned my, my, my blog. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I did was I did a blog post on my favorite books, okay, or favorite books or favorite landscape books, you know, because you're, you're always reading about lists of the hundred books you must read in your lifetime. Well, what if you would begin like a canon, a library of must-read garden books? You know, what books would you include? So I basically put my, the, maybe my favorite 10 on, on my bookshelf. And I have lots of books, and I can't stop buying books on it. So I put down my favorite 10 at that moment. Um, I, I took that, and I actually posted it on LinkedIn, and I tweeted it out. And I had so many people who talked about their books. And it was just really wonderful because it was about sharing. Um, and that's what social media is about. 
So um, my favorite book I would say that I would recommend to somebody is Bring Nature Home. It's a book by Douglas Tallamy, who's um, he's, uh, he's at the University of Delaware. He's a dean there. And it is about how you can sustain wildlife with native plants. It's about the symbiotic relationship between native plants and insects and birds. And um, I just... I just love that book because it's 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 a major point that we need to understand is that there's a relationship between native plants and insects. They have evolved together for millions of years. And then there's the birds. Well, you know, I think 90% of all birds um, raise their young on insects. It's about planting certain trees, native trees like an oak an oak supports, I think, 500 species of Lepidoptera, and which would be moths and, um, and butterflies, whereas something like a Zelkova or an Alanthus tree, I think they do support two different types of, 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 of butterflies or none whatsoever. So, yeah, it's about uh, planting, using native plants and trying to add those to your, um, to your own garden, to your own landscape. Brilliant. Outstanding. Uh, finally, question five. You've traveled, you grow roses, you grow tomatoes, you work on other people's spaces. Is there anything you've never grown personally that you would love to experiment with in the garden? Um, I don't really grow annuals outside of a tomato, outside of basil. Um, I, don't grow, I don't grow plants that are not in my zone seven. Um, yeah. So what would that be? Um, gosh, I'm sorry. No, it's a hard question. Just nothing comes up. Nothing comes up. Um, well then let me rephrase the question is here. We have a brand new year in front of us. Right. What are you looking forward to most in terms of gardening for 2015? It's really, for me, it's just about building new gardens, um, building beautiful spaces. Uh, I, I like to experiment with plants on my roof garden, uh, which is a difficult, it's a difficult environment. It's not the perfect environment for every plant. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to be able to plant more native grasses. But again, you only have so much, I'm, I'm working in, in, in planters and you only have so much space. So, um, yeah. Nice. Um, listeners, make sure you follow Todd on Twitter, at TH Garden Design. Uh, go to his blog. Uh, I'll have a link up for that book article on his 10 favorite books as well, up on his blog at www.toddhaymanlandscapedesign.com. Todd, you've been an amazing guest. Lots of brilliant information. Oh well, thank you so much. I mean, I could, I could, like like so many other people who are uh, um, plant crazy or or loving horticulture. You can talk about plants. You can talk about gardens forever. We have listeners now in sixty two countries, and I want to invite you to have the last word to them today. Can you leave us with a note of encouragement or a pearl of wisdom? Uh, you're putting me on the spot. I would, I would just say to um, embrace your passion and people who, um, who like gardening or think that they like gardening but feel that they don't have a green thumb, it's not about having a green thumb or not. I believe it's just about uh, doing a little research and putting the right plant in the right place. And, vir- and everyone can be successful if you just do a little research and say, okay, where is this plant most comfortable with? And think about where that plant actually grows in nature. You know, if it's an if it's an understory shrub, if it grows underneath the canopy of trees, well, then it needs to be in part shade or shade. If it's a plant that grows like um, like switchgrass, maybe it grows out in the plains. Well, then it would be it would be great even on a on a roof garden because what do you have there? You have a lot of desiccation. You have bright sun. You have wind, um, and those are the same elements that you end up having 
on on a beach or on the on, on the plains. So think about where a plant grows in nature and just give it the same same situation. And most times you'll be successful. Outstanding. You've been a tremendous guest. Thanks for being on the show, Todd. Thank you so very much.